Welcome, and thank you for joining us for Contemporary Art Taos 2020, the artist interview series. This series consists of short interviews between myself and our exhibiting artists, and will be ongoing throughout the duration of the show twice a month. I'm Nicole, I'm the curator here at Harwood Museum of Art, and joining us today is the wonderful Paul O'Connor. Welcome, Paul. Hey, Nicole, how you doing? Good, nice to have you here. Good to be here. Behind me is two of Paul's beautiful works, XH33 and SQ44. I can't get around and move too much, but um, I think Paul's going to show us some up close and personal looks in his studio while we're here. So let's jump right into questions. Um, let's talk process and materials. How do you create these beautiful objects, including the perfect shining finish and the organic textures? If you get up close to these pieces, the patina on some of the work actually looks like, like wood or stone. It, look, it looks very organic and natural. Yeah, so um, the organic and patina work I uh, do here um, using various chemistry or just household products like vinegar and baking soda and whatnot to create those patinas. And of course the woodworking, um, I've been in building and carpentry my whole life, making furniture, sculpture. So that, that's all done here. The, um, the automotive paint I'm really attracted to, but I really can't do. So th that actual, the black or the gray was done by somebody who just does cars. So I, I, I have somebody else do that step. Um, but it's what, it's the effect I want to go in, you know, in combination with my work. Is it the traditional like sprayed auto paint that's buffed after and waxed? Is it the same thing? Yeah, absolutely. And the, the trick is actually finding somebody who will work on something that's not a car. <laughs> it's like, you know, so I've gone through a lot of different painters and, and um, have finally found a couple that I work with that are, that are just fantastic. Yeah. Um, so the history in Taos is very much integrated with the art history of this place. You've been here for a while and been involved with a lot of the artists that have been here. Tell us about how you came to Taos and um, some of your experiences living through the changes in the art world here. Well, um, we arrived in 1989 on our honeymoon. TC and I, neither of us had ever been to New Mexico. And um, I worked in an art gallery in Malibu, California called Tops. And their print, one of their main artists there was uh, Jim Wagner. So I met Jim there at the gallery and um, he extended an invitation, said, yeah, come to Taos anytime. So, um, you know, I love deserts. So I was taking TZ into all these deserts of California, the Mojave, um, Borrego Springs, Joshua Tree. And she was reading a book about Georgie O'Keeffe and brought up the word Taos. And I said, Taos, I know a guy there. Let's go look him up. So we drove over and never left. Within three days, we rented a house, drove back to Malibu, packed and came right back. That was 31 years ago. <laughs> And um, so when I first got here, actually there's a photo I wanna show you. Jim introduced me to, how do I share? Oh, you know what? I can't share, can I? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna flip this camera around. This is a panoramic photo taken by Gus Foster of our Sunday night poker group. So I got invited into this group and the photo begins and ends with Jim Wagner, you know, Ron Davis, there's Gus, Larry Bell, Kevin Cannon, Ken O'Neill, kind of goes around, me with hair, Paul mm -hmm. Pascarella. So anyways, that, that group of guys really um, changed my world, changed my life. Um, you know, I started, doing a, a portrait series, which continues to this day. 
And I started going around the table, basically photographing everyone there. And, um, and then of course was doing photography and assisting uh, Ron Davis, Larry Bell, you know, Ron Cooper, he's not in that photo, but he was a regular as well. So they really became like um, my mentors. I love that photo by Gus, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. And so let's uh, talk about the subject matter of these works. Um, there's yeah. this of the rational and the mystical in your work that generates a really compelling personal engagement. When I hear you talk about the work, you speak about the void that's present in the center of these works um, and the meditation that can be found uh, whenever, you, whenever you really search on that, but also these tools of measurement and using rulers and logical natures uh, are the logical nature of numbers. So how do you balance such seemingly contrary approaches, this, this rational and this mystical, or do you not find them to be contrary? Not really, and, and the key word there is balance. I think, um, you know, that's, that's the whole trick of, of life is finding balance between the, the rational and the spiritual. You know, if you're too much in one direction or the other, I, I, you know, it's, I don't know how to qualify it, but it's not in balance. So it's really the two elements that I find most intriguing to work with. I don't think I've done maybe justice talking about the element of the void in your work. Do you mind maybe expounding on that a little bit for the, the viewers? Yeah, and if I can talk maybe a little bit too about how I came upon it. Okay. Um, so how do I start this? It's so multi-layered, um, <laughs> but in the early 90s, I was, how I even came on to be doing sculpture is um, I was assisting Ron Davis when he switched from painting to sculpture. And those three years working for him in his studio really planted a seed that just has blossomed for me um, years later in 2011, 2012, when I decided to launch into my own work. And I started with, and it's perfect, you have them right behind you, the square and the hexagon. And the hexagon, um, honestly, it was really a nod to Larry Bell. You know, I, I used to photograph his uh, glass cubes for years. And when I would photograph them on a four by five camera, you would see the top of the cube and the sides, but not have parallax. In other words, these lines would be parallel. So essentially this is a flattened version of a cube, you know? And, and the square is, um, you know, a similar cousin. But anyways, I was doing these, a whole series of these little squares, you know, of just, metal and wood, just playing around. And in this one, I don't know if you can see in the camera, but the knot fell out. Do you see that black hole right above it? Yeah, and I thought, oh darn, it's, it's ruined. <laughs> but then it, it actually kind of reminded me of Ken Price's holes in his work. So that, that was really an important little breakthrough. Um, there's other holes I've been inspired by, including uh, Ron Cooper, which again, I can't share that photo. I just took a photo from his studio of a piece that just blew me away 30 years ago. And it's a simple wooden uh, disc with a round carved piece of stone. And in the middle of that is an open, um, there's light that comes out. So instead of black, it's actually light. So what it spoke to me too is of um, Dharmakaya, which is in, in Buddhism of the three kayas, it's like the essential uh, primordial void from which everything comes. So it's, it's, it's 
vastness, its spaciousness. And it's really about that. For me, these black voids are symbolic of the spacious mind. And I just love the purity of that black. I mean, it's just, it's fantastic. It is certainly something you need to see in person too. It's really hard to, to get across in a, a two-dimensional image, but you know, they're actually recessed spaces that have this intense blackness in them. Um, yeah. Uh, do you take inspiration from the natural world um, in your art? Oh, absolutely. And, and there too, um, you know, what I love about Taos, what really drew me to Taos is that that big sky and that vista, that, that horizon line, excuse me. Both Teasy and I grew up along the ocean. I grew up primarily in Santa Monica and, um, you know, just having that vista, that view of the horizon, that horizon line. And coming here, you still have that extreme vastness. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then of course, going back to this photo and Gus Foster, who is another, you know, visual um, inspiration for me. You know, I've lived with his photographs for years. Um, I think these, this new series of pieces is really coming out of that too. And that's why I hung these together to share that with you. You know, these, this series I'm, I'm calling Vistas and Figures. And when they hang uh, this way, they're figures. And when they hang the other way, I'm calling them Vistas. So yeah, the visual vocabulary um, comes right out of that, that horizon line, that panoramic framing. That's great. So moving back a little bit to your surface texture, I'm interested in your choice of automotive paint. Are you interested conceptually in the American history of automobile production um, as it relates to industrialization, mass production, um, yeah. the war era? Yeah. I, I, maybe I'm taking this too far, but uh, or yeah. maybe with beauty and speed that comes with the obsession with cars. Yeah, you you obviously haven't seen my truck. I don't care about cars. <laughs> I never have. Um, I do, you know, like through other people's passion for them, I see them as, you know, amazingly designed sculptures and stuff. But myself personally, I, I really don't care about cars. Um, but that finish for me really too, I have to give the nod back to Ron Davis and his, um, his resin pieces, you know, in the early um, mid or the, yeah, early eighties when I first met Ron and visiting him up in his um, studio built by Frank Gehry up in Malibu standing in front of these dodectagons, these amazing, you know, masterpieces of uh, resin. It's just that liquid, light, reflective, translucent. It's got so much going on that that's the real attraction for me. You've really preempted my next question, but I um, uh -oh. want to expand on it. That would be great. Uh, so some of the group of artists that moved from Los Angeles to Taos and famously from the Ferris Gallery scene in Los Angeles share your interest in slick finishes and abstract designs that often out of fiberglass or mediums associated with the automobile. So how have you been informed and inspired uh, by those artists, Larry Bell and Ron Davis specifically? I think you've already told us a little bit. Yeah, I mean, hugely uh, would be the short answer. But yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm essentially a West Coast guy and I went to some of those exhibits you know the Finnish fetish and going to the Corcoran gallery and um, just that whole scene there in 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 LA Santa Monica and the surf culture I grew up surfing too so it was all there you know well, uh, just to wrap up, do you want to show us any projects that you're working on now? Um, anything you're excited about or that we could look forward to? Yeah, well, of course, you know, I was supposed to have this show um, at the Bryce Gallery. 
I'm going to see if I can put this here. And of course, it was canceled because of COVID, but it's, um, you know, figures and vistas, which, which are these new works, which I have not shown anywhere yet. Um, but I'm working on other iterations of them. There's one kind of back here in the, in the corner. And, and then I've just found a new painter in, in Santa Fe. And I'm really excited about this one. I don't know if you can see, but it, it's like a Mercedes Porsche black and brass piece. So the story behind this one, I don't know if we have just a minute here. I'll show you from my video, Paul, actually. Oh, we don't. Oh, no, we do. But can you get us closer to the bronze detail? So we, it was hard to see from where you were. Yeah, I was first going to show you the piece, that brass piece. It was two thirds. It's one solid piece of brass, but one third of it had a patina on it. It got damaged. So it's been in a box for the past two, three years. And I finally had the idea to have it painted black and then grind back through. So you, you can still see the patina, oops, that was down below and then the black. Oh God, there's so much reflection. I'm sorry, I'm not aiming this very well. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, it looks. So, and it's, it's also kind of um, along the lines. It's not the first time I've done that. There's a piece over at 203 Gallery. In fact, if if you haven't seen that gal that show yet, it's really worth going to see. But I have a piece there that I ground back down, so it's multiple layers. That's yeah. excellent. Well, thank you so much for giving us this time today, Paul. We loved hearing from you and seeing the behind the scenes in your studio. And thank you all for joining us. Please stay tuned. Our next artist interview will be with Afton Love on November 11th. Thanks. Great. Okay. Ciao. Bye.